Hello, everybody. Gracias por haber venido, ¿eh? Que nos vamos a estar aquí. Hoy. Hola, me llamo Jan Kurtz y este es el 25, uy, 25 años de Cultural Thursday, celebrando hoy. Yo, ya, yeah, gracias. <laughs> y bueno, bienvenidos. Y es un placer tenerlos aquí. Yo soy de los Estados Unidos. Y esta es mi amiga, Tracy. Hello, 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 liebe Gäste. Um, ich heiße Tracy und ich lehre Deutsch und Spanisch hier bei CLC. Und es ist so schön, dass Sie alle hier sein können. Könnten. Dzień dobry, nazywam się Ania Antus, uczę ekonomii na Kolegiu Central Lakes. Bardzo miło was wszystkich witać. Witajcie. Bonjour, Maji Tazibi, Kwe Indigena Kaz, Dude Magizi. My name is Mary Sam, and I welcome you to Central Lakes College. I'm the Dean of Students here. Hello, and my name is Joey Yao. Thank you for being here today for our Cultural Thursday presentation, our first of our 25th year. Um, I am from North Carolina and came to Brainerd by way of Las Vegas, Pittsburgh, New York City, and finally New Jersey. Um, being exposed to many different cultures in my life, I've always seen the value of exploration um, and the value of curiosity. And as the director of the Performing Arts Center and as the new coordinator for the Cultural Thursday program, I'm really grateful to be uh, able to support the work of the Cultural Thursday program um, and to encourage your own interest in exploration and, um, the, um, and getting out there and traveling. Um, I, it is my pleasure to welcome Jan Kurtz along with Gary Payne and the Spirit Movement Dance to kick off our 25th year of Cultural Thursday. I hope you will also join us again on October 5th when we will have author Phil, uh, Phil Hunsicker talking about his work, The Crocodile Man and the People of the Centra Af Central African Republic. So please enjoy today's show. We hope to see you back and we also hope to see you out there in the world. Thank you. Suspenso. Yes, misterioso. Oh, mira, mi libro. <laughs> As this is coming down, I am going to do that blatant moment. Uh, like a week after COVID hit, so did my book. And so I will be starting a little bit from my story, but I would first like to point out that if you see the kind of the little area there, I've, there's two heads there. One of them belongs to Mary, who is right there, 
And George, where did you go, George? So two of the people in the 1998 picture are here with us today. So gracias. And I'm here to talk about what I call my passion, which is language and culture and how you can get two lives for the price of one or three or four or five, and how you can have fun as a code switcher. Hmm, that makes it a little more sexy. And uh, just having more dimensions to your life than just the one point of view that we're brought up with, which is, the big word there is ethnocentric. So my story, and this is the only time, well, it is available at the Central Lakes College uh, store and downtown, anyway. At age 15, I was a very strong C minus student in Spanish. And I think my parents were trying to save me, so they arranged to send me to Mexico for three weeks with one of their friends, Lorraine, and Lorraine's 18-year-old daughter, Cindy. I did not know much as my grade showed, but um, within the first day, I learned a lesson that has stayed with me the rest of my life. We needed to eat when we got to Saltillo. We went to a restaurant where there were a lot of locals parked. There's a hint. And one of the first things that happened is Lorraine's forehead started to sweat. And her eyes started to water. And she grabbed at her throat. And I thought, whew. And I saw a mesero, a waiter, coming over with a pitcher of water. Well, I knew a couple things about Mexican water. And I'm wanting to point out that words without culture or background are still meaningless words. You needed to know that agua could have made her extremely sick. It could have put her on the toilet, one head, one side or the other, one under the other, for a long time, Montezuma's revenge. So I said, no, agua, no, no agua. Two words. And the guy stopped, and I also knew a second cultural thing, and that is that what you need if you are going to have your hot, burning, picante go away. You need leche. You need milk. You don't need Coke. You don't need water. You need leche. And I said, leche, por favor. And this grown man turned around and did what I had ordered him to do. <laughs> I liked that. So words are important. Words without culture, not so much meaning. And there is a lot of power in our words. So I will read this. I know you can read, but uh, this is being recorded. So here's one of my fun little stories. Mother Mouse was crossing the street with her three little children. She got about halfway across the road when she spotted a cat crouched and ready to pounce upon them. The cat and Mother Mouse eyeballed each other for two to three minutes. Finally, Mother Mouse opened her mouth and let out an enormous woof. The cat quickly scurried away. Mother Mouse turned to her three little ones and said, now do you see the advantage of a second language? <laughs> words matter, even if you're only using your English words or the, you know, your native language. But are you calling that group of politicians your government? Or did we use the word regime? That guy that's sitting at the park, did you call him a geezer? Or is he an elder? And when you look at the food, maybe in a restaurant that is in another country, is that stuff weird or just different? In my classes, I almost always, in the many faces of Mexico class, creator is in our midst today, I said, draw a house. And I usually got the house with the red roof. Even though you said house, even though you translated to casa, are you still talking about the same thing? What's the other person's perspective? And we all come from different cultural backgrounds and how we view, number one, Mother Earth, I think. This is an Argentine um, cartoonist. It's a Mafalda's cartoon guy, Kino. And I look at this and I go, oh my gosh, I can see Europe coming into the Americas. Uh, the Americas was an Eden of plants and animals and medicinal things, and the Europeans saw it as a vast wasteland. 
And since the beginning of time, we have religions. One of the first things, probably even with the caveman, they looked up into the skies, they started trying to figure out what their beginnings were, and they started with their belief systems. And yes, we have, oh my, we have Sue in here today with us, and we also have Abra with two lovely children. And we were at, and I want to make a point. These are considered or called the Aztec Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon, but the Aztecs actually just tripped upon a, a location that was already there for three or 400 years. And the rumor is that maybe climate change was a problem and these people all had to leave, but that's another cultural Thursday. But on the other side, we have La Sagrada Familia by Gaudí in Barcelona. So we have the Aztec religion coming together with the Catholic religion. And when the Catholics saw the Aztecs practicing their human sacrifices, they thought, oh, Horrors, horrors. But they didn't see that they had Jesus Christ on a cross, the one sacrifice for all. And the ritual that came out of that is called communion. And yes, we have ministers here too today. No? Yeah, I'm a minister's kid. We break the bread, the body of Christ. We drink the blood shed for you. Hmm. Just another viewpoint. When cultures come together, the Catholic, in this case in the Americas, the Catholic and the indigenous, not just the Aztecs, came together. And when you have something, I guess it's called syncretic, there will be a test later, syncretic, and that means that you've taken two things, but they come out to something that is different, but you can identify different pieces of it. So here, every day at the Virgen de Guadalupe, the Basilica in Mexico City, people are there on pilgrimage. They're crawling on their hands and knees. They're dancing. And this is, in this case, some dancers that have put together the Catholic and the indigenous beliefs. And here are some things we've seen on this stage right here over the 25 years. Locally, we have the Vespertine tribal people. And I believe one of them is still doing belly dance classes through the community ed. We have had the um, orphans, and I'll get to that word later, from Mexico, Cuernavaca, doing the traditional dance. We have Maria Elena La Cordobesa with guitarist uh, Michael Hauser doing their flamenco here on stage. You notice we have the ever so wonderful, there they are, right there. We've got Oscar dancing with Michelle at one of our eight festivals. In the middle up here, we have uh, the Chamame group from Argentina. We have Leo Lara and Kathy Lara singing their Peruvian music. And at the end, take a really good look at this last picture because that's how you're going to get out of here today, OK? <laughs> and yet we don't have to leave the country. We, in fact, are in a country that, uh, for most of us, was not ours to begin with. And so just down the road, 30 miles, we have the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe and their powwows. They're very welcoming. You can go there, you can try the foods, buy the crafts, and you will be invited to dance along. And they have brought to us an incredible richness, or we can learn from their incredible richness, because the regalia is symbolic. You know, there's a reason they do a grass dance. There is a history behind the jingle dance, and I think it is more than worth our time to learn about all of our neighbors. And that is, yeah, Gary Payne did that photo, I'm quite sure wasn't mine. <laughs> Foods that very often bring people together, and um, the, you know, we all have a yuck factor. But before we get real, um, you know, what do we say, righteous about, oh my gosh, look at what they're eating. Um, one of the things I did as a college student when I studied in Seville, Spain, is my friends and I, once a week, would go out and we would order something that we had no idea what it was. That is how I learned the word callos. Cayos are like tripe, they're like innards, they are like intestines. And being able to say nothing good about those, I will just say they were chewy. <laughs> in the lower, le uh, the lower left here, there's my reflection and Dario's reflection. Um, he was an exchange teacher from Argentina here with us at the college. And I visited him in Buenos Aires. And oh my gosh, on a Sunday, asado, the whole family gets together and they eat meat for like four hours. And I'm not a fan of the pigs here, down here, but I just love to take their pictures. 
Oh, there she is again. This is the princess of pastry sitting in the back there. And um, Sue is, you know, she's, she knows her pastries, yes. Vicki, who is down here on the lower right, used to teach Spanish here. And um, she made us some tortillas. But a tortilla in Spain is an omelet, and a tortilla in Mexico is not an omelet. And in Spain, they call them patatas. And in Mexico, they call them papas. No big deal. They can understand each other. But it is a big deal when Pope John Paul went to Texas and an entrepreneur put on a whole bunch of t-shirts with the Pope's image, El Gran Papa. <laughs> that meant the great potato, not the great Pope. Also from uh, the school here, we have Hauni and Andrea, I believe her name was, yes. And they were part of our CCID group. And here's a great thing. Share your culture with somebody else. Invite them into your house. Show them how we do things. And get your Christmas cookies decorated at the same time. Not everybody has a taste for root beer. That's an acquired taste. My friends in Spain, before marshmallows arrived in Spain, thought that if they put those little kind of gooey, sugary things onto a fork and put it on a flame on their gas stove, that that was just like what Charlie Brown was doing. Well, after you've burned your hand and tried to clean up your stove, it, no, not the same thing. A lot of international students that have come my way think that you really need to eat chicken with, your, with, with a fork and spoon and that eating with your hands is just caveman. And if you go to a potluck and you put that jello right next to that, oh yeah, hot dish stuff that's already a conglomeration of who knows what, and they melt together, and the sweet goes with the meat. That is just yuck, gross, ay! <laughs> and how does this food come to some people? This is a woman in Guatemala, outside of Antigua, who is carrying her corn kernels on her head to go to the woman that's got a little place where you can get it all ground into the flour that you need to make the tortilla. Now here's where I want us to think outside the big, or the big picture, because I went along with a medical mission, and, and uh, Jorge, who is here, I think has done 12 medical missions, and other people in Brainerd and St. Cloud have done numerous, dozens of missions, including Tanzania. But before we go on a mission with a church or with the medical or whatever, I ask you to know something about your culture. Because here we got a guy carrying the wood. Here we've got the woman carrying her stuff on her head. And they came to us with backaches, headaches, and hernias. And we gave them little blue pills. And we told them to take them three times a day with water and with food. Some of these people might have had a tortilla or two per meal with a little salt on it. Water. Oh, Okay, we're going to put the jug on our head, we're going to walk to the spigot, we're going to walk to the creek, we're going to walk to the well, and then we're going to walk back. And this is not clean water, so now we're going to boil it, so we need that wood, okay? Half of it boils away. Now take your pill. Nah, come on, it's a bigger picture, it's a bigger picture. So we come in at least with appropriate technology. Ethnocentric is the other word of the day, and that is, you know, somebody could walk in and say, well, why is this kid so proud of In fact, what is that thing? No, he does not need one of the stoves like we have here. This is an appropriate technology stove. You cut less wood. The wood is put into a smaller area. It stays warm longer. You get the wood and the fire off the floor where children sometimes trip and fall in, creating horrible burns. You get the woman off the floor, and you get the smoke out of her eyes, out of everybody's face, the asthma, you go on and on and on because it's going up a pipe. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. Maybe not for you, but maybe for them. And if you're out working in the country, yes, this is the way you do it. You've got your big comal pan. You make those great tortillas. And if you don't have the chicken, at least you've got the refried beans. Amazing guacamole and these handmade tortillas. And it is, again, another whole cultural Thursday if we're going to dive into how much meat are we eating, how much are those cows eating, what are the, never mind, here we go. Wash day in Guatemala, we probably don't want to do it this way either. However, these people don't need necessarily a Maytag. 
these women used to be in the river with their kids. So the soap and sometimes the kids were going downstream. They were beating their clothes on rocks. So this is an improvement. This is a pila. And you get them off, off of the knees and out of the rocks and into some clean water. The water drains underneath so it's not going downstream. They have the little washboard things in there and you take your little you know, soap and you soap it up and then you take that little blue pan and you scoop the clean stuff and then you get it all um, you know, rinsed. And this couple, these two women here are from Iowa. They were working with Rising Villages, which is a program out of Little Falls. And this, this Mayan woman was delighted to show these two farm women how to do the, you know, how to do the wash. And um, she didn't need to have a septic system. She didn't need to have all that plumbing stuff. She didn't need to have a special, I don't know, a screw or a bolt when her washing machine broke down and she got her socialization with her friends. See how you keep the kids there from going downstream? <laughs> and another thing I added because of the fact that uh, I just thought it was real innovative to put your kid in a crate. So this other woman is at the plaza and she's selling some food and um, that's the way she was child caring there with a crate. And you know, I'm not gonna have you raise your hand, but. Barbie the movie has come out and hit all of us folks that were around earlier on with the Barbie conundrum. And um, I'm pretty sure you noticed I did not grow up to be like Barbie even when I'm on my tiptoes. And this young girl, this was her toy. And I don't, maybe I read too much into it, but to see people that are never gonna grow up to look like Barbie, self-included, this was the toy that she was playing with, and it was her prized possession. And um, I'm going to do another real quick ad, I think. I just, I have a blog that's free, and you can sign up for it out there with your emails, but my next 17th of September is going to be an essay on Barbie the Conundrum, and what, what happens with the dolls and the toys we play with, and what kinds of um, effects. But here we are with Barbie in Guatemala. And the young mother back there, this is what she looked like when she went to Mexico with us. She is reading, Abra has had taken Spanish here. She went along with us with the, what we call the Cuernavaca Five, not a mafia group. And um, because of her Spanish, she's been able to travel to other countries and she was able to, to read to this young child. And here's where the word orphanage comes in. Um, this is not really an orphanage because nobody here is allowed to be adopted. The idea is, why in, in this group of people would we want someday to just have somebody snatched up and sent off to somebody and who knows where? You shouldn't have your brothers and sisters just disappear. And so this orphanage has about six, 700 people, but they've got their own pigs, they've got their own tilapia pond, they've got their own tortilla making, they've got their own high school. If they're there for 18 years, they can go to college. It is run, yes, by the Catholic Church and our personal connection here in Minnesota. Here we are, Tracy and the bunch of us, standing in front of one of the buildings that was built with donations from Minnesotans. And um, Joe and Phyllis DeRozier may or may not be people that you knew, but they had 25 festivals in this town raising money for this particular location outside of Cuernavaca. And there's Sue again, but now she's got underpants. Tira and Sue, uh, Tira used to work here, and we asked before we went down what the orphanage could possibly use, and they said kids' underpants. So we had a Spanish club collection of kids' underpants. I never saw so many action figures in my life. And um, the fun part of this story is that when we went through customs, you get a red light or a green light, and Tira had the big suitcase, and she got the red light, which means she had to stop and show what she had in her suitcase. <laughs> Good thing we knew Spanish, we could explain. First time I saw what looks like Easter eggs here, um, I was in uh, Mazatlan and it happened to be carnival and I wasn't sure why people were throwing things at me. And at the time, in the 80s, I thought it's probably because of our relationship and our government and their government and I'm the dirty American and oh my gosh, we better run and hide. No, 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 these eggs are filled with confetti. And the trick is you go up behind someone, and you go whack, and then you run. Or you slap them on the back, whoosh, and then you run. Or you just throw from across the room and the confetti is everywhere. It's all in fun. We might not, in this culture, have so much trouble with seeing skulls, or we might. But um, 
This is all about Day of the Dead and one of my absolute favorite holidays. Mexico's Day of the Dead has taught me how to grieve. Our country does not do very well with grieving. We're stuck kind of in denial. We're getting better. But here you can see that they've put a, a, laid out this guy in effigy. He's got his soccer outfit there. The Virgin of Guadalupe is up on the wall. There's some of his favorite foods, flowers, special flowers, maybe even a whole bottle of his favorite alcoholic drink. Because the saying in Mexico is the final death is when no one or your name is no longer uttered. That's death. So every year, they'll say your name. This is one of my four fun. Language, music, art, photography, these are things that bring people together. And um, this guy here, the artist, was doing marvelous, iconic paintings of the flamenco and the bullfight. And I stepped back and saw the fattest Spider-Man I've ever seen in my life. The news is, this was like, I don't know, 2017. I went back with my family to Spain in April. He's still there, and he still hasn't lost any weight. <laughs> this was one of the field trips we took, because sometimes culture comes to us, and we were so excited to have Frida. Out of three cities in the whole United States, Minneapolis got one of the exhibits. And here we are. And uh, the two people on the end, we've got Margarita, and we've got uh, Jackie, and so Puerto Rican and Mexican. But all of those that weren't, oh wait, there, we have a Honduran hiding behind a Frida there. But anyway, um, we enjoyed going to see Frida Kahlo on our own turf. And, oh, and Jamie's here. Jamie and I went to Mexico and saw the butterflies. I added this one because I have great concern for the fact that we have walls between our countries. And if for no other reason to say, hey, the animals can't migrate, birds can fly across, butterflies can make it, but we are all connected at some level. And so I would say here, when they cut down a tree in Mexico that is the habitat for the um, butterfly, and we come up here and we put pesticides on our lawns, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping on anybody's feet, but we are mowing all sorts of roadsides and lawns and places that could be pollinator. So how can we all come together because these butterflies go back and forth and they're beloved all the way down and all the way back, or all the way there and here, not down, not up. Hey, there she is in the front row. Claudia really did one solo journey around the world. Yes, there she is. You can talk to her later. She, I can't give you the name of. But she gave a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation here. So we've got just a couple of cultural Thursdays of the past. Um, Michael Hopps and also Sandy Kaplan, both people that teach or taught here, went to Vietnam. And I like this because we used to be Vietnam's enemy, or they were our enemy. And uh, we had very nice presentations on those countries. Sarah Gorman went to India. We've got the Ganges River here. And I'll have to confess, I'm glad this is not going on in the Mississippi, but you know, we also live by an excellent, very famous river. So when you cross it five times a day, take a moment and realize where that is in the global perspective. And my own personal little picture of my mom. The reason I have her here is because for her 80th birthday, she wanted to go and see the tulips. And we took my one and only little river cruise. So if you've got your health, don't tell me you're too old. Just go do it. And the final one here of past cultural Thursdays are of, maybe some of you remember Spencer Hartsock. He never expected to end up in China. And he did, and he, many students have come to the stage to give their uh, shows to us from their perspective. International students have been on the stage to tell about their countries. Our students from here have told about their trips. So Spencer's waving goodbye. And this is one of my favorite photos. Yes, I'm standing on a box. Um, but these are two former students of mine. I did not teach them any Spanish. They're native speakers, Lucia from Mexico. Well, and Blanco's from Mexico as well. And there was this positive charge thing going on with a photographer. And um, so if you go over, you could get your picture taken. So we grabbed three of these 
stereotypical iconic sombreros out of my office. We ran over to the crossing. We got our picture taken. And Lucia put down, las tres amigas hacen un mundo mejor. The three amigas make for a better world. Now I'm going to take a few moments because I have asked, and he agreed, to, I don't know, uh, what should we say, give some kudos to the man who has given 25 presentations during the, or 24. He's going to do 25 this year. I think we're going to round up that number. And so I would like to have Gary come up to accept the probably one only, maybe annual, I've Been Everywhere Man Award. So would you please come up? And here are some places he's been. That's my least favorite photo. Let's just go a couple more. Go ahead and say a few things. I'll just keep clicking. OK. Thank you, Gary, for coming Oh, today. my pleasure. You're on the track. Well, yeah, I like this uh, thing that she put up here. It makes me feel tall. This is, yeah. Uh, I feel like an exhibit here, but um, watch, watch this. Oh, yeah. You do that. There's something Thank on the you. top of her head, you know. Try it in the hallway if you see her out here. She, she loves it. Well, if you're here, you don't need a sermon from me. You're already converted, and I know some of you. You've been to a lot of my presentations. And these are the posters from, from them. And uh, uh, it was, uh, it's been a long, strange trip, uh, all these places. Speaking of Vietnam, that's where I realized uh, I needed to get smart, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so... Uh, I started traveling, and, and Mary's traveled with me quite a bit, and my son has traveled with me, and, and uh, some of these pictures are because they spotted something, you know? And so I'm really glad that they were with me. But this thing with Jan and, and uh, Tracy is just amazing. This has been a bridge uh, to understanding. That's a big deal. In a world where we've got uh, 8 billion people, there's only 2.5 billion when I was born. Now we've got 8 billion people. We're bristling with um, nuclear weapons and, and uh, cluster bombs and that kind of thing. Understanding is not a luxury anymore. We've got to really play a, a tight game. And uh, Jan and Tracy uh, understood this from the beginning. Uh, this came from them. This wasn't a school activity. They, they created this thing. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's really important. And I'm, I'm proud to be of it and I, uh, you know, part of it. And I, and I thank them for their uh, considerable effort to do this. And that's about all I have to say. Oh, well, did you see Tracy? No. Am I don't, done? Don't fall I don't off. want to get don't off fall here. Off. OK, all right. OK, just don't fall off. OK, here we go. Don't leave yet. Okay, I said it was a humble thing. <laughs> what I have in here is a pencil sharpener that's part of a globe, and I would like Gary to stay sharp while he keeps traveling around the globe. <laughs> and Tracy? I'll, I'll carry it with me always. So I remember hearing about Gary Payne when I was a teacher at the high school in Staples and about him jumping on the back of a truck when he was in Columbia to go back into the backwoods to get to know the, the guerrilla fighters or something. I'm like, who is this man? <laughs> but it, um, amongst all these years of Cultural Thursdays, we're really grateful to you for giving all your time and expertise and sharing those stories of traveling and interacting with the locals and how important your messages were. So we have... Um, the Diversity of Global Connections Club has given you a, a t-shirt. <laughs> I'll just say, if this was a clever way to get me to retire, I'm not doing it. No, no, no. But I am really grateful. He was saying, oh, I'm not going to go up there. Oh, I don't want to. And I said, yeah, you do. So. We have got two things left. We have a little poem that Tracy and I are going to read. And um, it was written by Bill Holm, who uh, is from, was from Minnesota. He has since passed. And he read it here on this stage 
the first time I ever heard it, and I don't know if he ever performed it anywhere else or not. But I ran up to him afterwards and I said, oh, could I use this for my Many Faces of Mexico class? And he said, here, and he signed the bottom of it, it's yours. I don't know if I've seen it any other place or not, but um, see what you get out of this. Yeah. It's called Künstlerleben. A warm June night in a little Minnesota town, a few neighbors leave their interior electric amusements for a while to smell the soft air, to watch the cut grass darken in the long sundown. Across the street, a ramshackle house flanked by rusty cars. It's the New Mexicans in town. Maybe 20 of them, even 30, all outside on the front lawn. Too many of them for that little house. But you know how they breed. Just look at that piebald paint, the crumbled stoop, the thriving thistles. They are not like us. All that black hair, those brown legs in shorts, the smell of chiles fried up in grease, the sound of the trilled R's, low laughter on a foreign tongue. Ooh, not like us, the neighbors nod. Soon there's music loud enough, loud enough for us to hear clear across the street. What are they doing? They're dancing, waltzing, the whole lot of them to Johann Strauss's Künstlerleben, the artist's life. Old ladies with boys, women with women, men with little girls, probably some combination of lovers. Where do they think they are? Vienna in 1880, not like us. Soon, they all join hands in a chain to circle the unkempt lawn in their pointy boots, sandals, brown bare feet. The waltz goes on and on with all the repeats, then over again. The light above the ash trees turns lavender and burnt orange. One, two, three. The neighbors cluck. What do they think they are doing? Just look at that. Waltzing, Waltzing on, on a, a summer, summer night, night to, to the, the artist's life. life. Not, Not like, like us. us. So, the thought as we waltz out of here is not a you and they and we and them. Add language and culture. Have another dimension to your life. Find out a different perspective. And um, how about we, we become we? So I would like to call up Oscar and uh, Michelle, because dance. We could dance. And I personally, oh my goodness, why did you want to sit still if there's good music? OK, then hit it. While they're doing that, again, thank you so much for coming. Spread the word. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, no kisses. He says, no besos, no besos, no me toques. OK. And thank you to those two amazing people.
Everybody gonna follow Michelle. <laughs> All the way down. Sign up for dance classes out at the table. Take a look at that table. You can do this. Gracias. <laughs>